The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast do not necessarily reflect or represent the views and opinions of WBGR Network. Good morning. Good morning and welcome back to the, or afternoon really, soon. Uh, welcome back to the Gospel Truth radio broadcast of the Servants for Christ Baptist Church uh, in Fort Washington, Maryland, uh, under the leadership of Pastor Jerry Jones Sr. We worship at 8 o'clock a.m. every Sunday morning at 713 Katy Drive in Fort Washington, Maryland. And if you're ever in that area, we uh, invite you and would welcome you to come and worship with you with us, uh, that we would be blessed by your presence and, and, and serve God by blessing you for being with us at the time. And so if you're ever in the Washington, D.C. area, or even if you live in this area, we welcome you and invite you to come and visit with us at 713 Katy Drive in Fort Washington, Maryland. We worship at 8 a.m. every Sunday, and every Sunday at 11 a.m. we are on this broadcast with the gospel truth. And we are inviting you this morning to think with me. I'm Reverend Beverly Moses, by the way, one of the associate ministers at the um, Servants for Christ Baptist Church in Fort Washington, Maryland. And I'm welcoming you this morning. I want you to think with me and meditate on some thoughts that the Spirit has been uh, wrestling with me about as I minister and observe and counsel and, and even examine my own life uh, so that I can take hold of those things that God has taken hold of me for so that I can achieve and take hold of the promises that God the great and many promises that God has given me, not only generally in his word, but even in my own personal spirit. And I run into so many people who are striving and pressing uh, toward, you know, taking hold of the things that God has promised to them and that God says that uh, are, are ours to have. And then I also run into many people, uh, both in my I work as a minister and when I previously practiced law as an attorney and as my I work in the human services area for a local government dealing with affordable housing and subsidized housing and other kinds of human services that are um, funded by the government and I know many of us there's too many of us saints who are stuck we are stuck in general in life we are stuck in certain areas of our lives. Uh, we are like uh, the man who laid by the pool at Bethesda, uh, uh, who said, you know, when Jesus asked him, would you be made whole? Who said, nobody, you know, helps me in the water. When, when the angel comes and troubles the water and it's time to be healed, I can't get there because I'm crippled and nobody helps me and people climb and get ahead of me. Uh, like this uh, situation where uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the leper came in Matthew chapter 8. The leper came to Jesus and uh, said, uh, and uh, Jesus said to him, he, he worshiped, he came to worship. And many of us are coming in our stuck condition and our, our limitation, our inability, it seems, to take hold of the things of the word of God for our personal lives. We come and we worship. We're in the churches, but we're not evidence. We're not witnessing the power of God in our own lives. So this leper, he came in uh, chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 1. It says, when he was come down, he meaning Jesus, from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And uh, Jesus told him, see thou 
uh, tell nobody, but go and show yourself uh, to the priest, which was uh, under the law, the thing to do. And, and, and the question is, how do we be like this leper? How do we get the deliverance, the, 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 the breakthrough from those things that hold us back, from those things that isolate us and separate us, from those things that limit our ability to take hold of the divine promises of God? And, and, and what has come to my spirit is, is the word for us is how do you uh, uh, get unstuck? And the answer is you do what you have to do. Okay, and in this text and in the text in Mark where, where Jesus tells the man laying at the pool, uh, get up and take up your bed and walk. Um, we listen to the word of God and we do what it says. The scripture says, you know, he'll say in that day of judgment, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I said? And we often preach and think about that text and those kinds of admonishments in the word of God uh, in terms of our uh, more uh, common churchly things about whether or not we um, tithe or whether or not we attend church or whether or not we do things that are more visible, almost like law-like, you know, and keep these kinds of rules of being good Christians. But too often we don't do these things when it comes to ourselves personally. We don't do what he says, that, you know, when he says we can command the mountain when we can speak life, when we can call those things that be not as though they were. Many times we don't do that in the areas of our greatest need. This man who was a leper, at least obviously acknowledged and recognized that he was a leper and had the audacity, though he should not have, to come among those who are worshiping because as a leper you're supposed to be outside of the camp away from people so you don't infect them but he came in some fashion uh, uh, in the presence of jesus whether with the crowd or in a separate place but he came and worshiped he came to the place of healing and so in order to get unstuck we have to be in the place of healing we have to be in the place of Jesus. We have to be in the place of faith and worship and learning and hearing the word to learn how to be delivered. And while he was there, even if like the rest of us, when we come before the Lord to present ourselves to worship and 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 and, and seek more faith even and, and worship in accordance with the faith that we have, when we come, he is searching us. He is he is, is giving us the opportunity uh, to be healed, to be delivered. And, and he is asking us, just like he asked this uh, uh, leper, every time we come before the Lord, do you want to be made clean? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be delivered? Do you want to get through this place where you're stuck? That's the question, you know, his arms are wide open. The, the, you know, the, the ears and, and blessings of God are, are there and available when we come. Every time we come boldly before the throne of grace and seeking help, we find help in our time of need, in our places of need. And so when we come, we should be coming, listening for and being open to receiving from God, hearing from God, in those areas that we need him most. And I believe that our biggest problems is that you and I and many in the church, I'm not even talking about unbelievers, come before the Lord with a limited portion of ourselves. And most often what we leave out are those very areas that we need him most. We come with our, <coughs> excuse me, our appearances, we come with our tithes. We come with our offerings. We come with our participation and membership in church. We come with our serving in the church in whichever role, even in, term, in, in pastorate, in ministry, as deacons, as elders, as ushers, as, as uh, committee members, as trustees. We come and give what we have to give. We come and worship and participate in corporate worship, but we don't come to take out, leave our burdens before the Lord. And many times we don't leave our burdens before the Lord because we're not facing them. What I'm finding my brothers and sisters as I examine deeply 
you know, as I encounter people that come to me for ministry and counsel and assistance in every capacity of my life, but particularly including as a minister, and even as I examine my own life in the deepest place, we have learned to cover up those places that we have the greatest need even to cover them up from God. And so we don't come saying, I'm sick, I need a physician. We come to fit in with everybody else, to look like everybody else, to not ask too much from the Lord or not ask that because maybe we feel unworthy. If I come before the Lord and say, Lord, I have a problem with, I don't learn well. I'm learning disabled. We don't come and do that, most of us. I, I am developmentally, dis my emotions, I get upset about things that other people don't get. I have an anger problem, Lord. We don't come, we hide it because we don't want other people to see. I have an alcohol or a drug addiction. It's secret. We don't bring that before the Lord. Or we, and, we, and since we're not bringing it before the Lord, nine times out of 10, we're not hearing God speak to those areas of our lives because we're not open to it. And so when, he, uh, uh, when he's asking us, like he asked the leper, do you want to be clean? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want a breakthrough? Do you want to be delivered? We're not hearing because we have so put that out of our minds and hidden that away that we forget about it. And so we come away from the word of God uh, in corporate worship, in preached word, in the word of God, in reading and meditating, just like we were in those areas when we first came. Like James said, we come as it were, uh, uh, like looking at ourselves in a perfect a face of God, which is a mirror on us, and then walk away as if we forgot what we saw while we were there because we've so pushed it away. But my brothers and sisters, this is where faith counts. This is what faith is for. I confess to you that I didn't buy my first home until late relatively in my life. And I did it not for me, but I did it so that I could take care of my mother who was then terminally ill and, and had been a great servant of God and continued to be a servant of God. But like me, which is where I learned it from, my mother had pieces of her life that she, it never occurred to her to believe God in that area. And I just didn't, my belief, my faith, my living out of all of what God had for me was limited because of that as well. And so I achieved one of the great promises and blessings of God in my life, home ownership, indirectly because I did it for her and I believed it hard for her. I declared those things that be not. I was motivated to do for her because I was declaring that she would not die in a nursing home feeling unloved and abandoned, which I know that was something she feared and never wanted. Okay, she had spent her life, much of her life, ministering and, and working with and for people who were in nursing homes. And, and so I just believed God, you know, for that, for her. But after she died, I realized what hindered me from believing God and taking hold of that many years ago for myself. So that I would be further along in the journey and the destiny that God laid out for me because there was something locked up in me that felt like that wasn't something to believe God for. I had to do this, I had to be this, I had to accomplish that. I couldn't apply the blind faith in that area of my life that I clearly applied in other areas of my life. Like when the Lord called me to leave my practice of law and come into ministry, I walked away without question. Didn't know, like Abraham, where I was going and exactly what I was being called to, but I knew it was the Lord and I had the faith to walk away, whatever happened. If I perished, I perished, but I was going to do what the Lord said do. I had great faith in that area, but it never entered other areas of my life. There are so many people in our churches 
in the body of Christ, whether a member of, of a particular church or not, who are living with limitations and disabilities and weaknesses that we're not believing God for. We're not putting those things before the Lord. And I ask, the, why is that, Lord? Well, there are obstacles. Some of them, however, are perceived obstacles, and in many ways all are perceived, and some are real. We perceive it to be an obstacle, let's say, uh, this man uh, with leprosy, or remember the man who whose friend, he was uh, paralyzed, and whose friends came, and there was a crowd, and so they went on the roof and tore off the roof and lowered him down before Jesus. There were obstacles. There was a crowd they couldn't get through. The lady with the issue of blood, there was a crowd there. This person with leprosy, obstacle was you're not supposed to be in this area, but he figured a way. The man laying at the pool the obstacles that he saw that nobody would help him because he couldn't walk. His inability to walk was an obstacle. You know, the fact that people wouldn't uh, help him was an obstacle. We are very, very versed, ready to give the reasons for our inability to move forward, for why we are stuck, for why we are not taking hold of the things, the prosperity. He said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Not only that your souls would be saved and be with me, in eternity, but right now, Jesus said to the disciples, not one has given up houses or land or whatever, except that they will have more in this life and eternal life in the, in, in the uh, eternity to come. So it is for us to uh, uh, be blessed and enjoy the benefits of being God's children in this life. And so the question becomes, what hinders us? And so back as I started, these obstacles. And we are very good at identifying why, what's the difference between me and, and whoever, you know, why they have great and I don't. And those are real obstacles. But the successful folk, the woman with the issue of blood, the, the leper in this story right here, Okay, the man who uh, uh, with who was paralyzed, whose friend, they find ways to overcome the obstacles. Do what you have to do to get unstuck. And so whatever obstacle you perceive, the crowd, no room. Jesus' parents even figured out no room in the inn. They asked somebody and they got a barn, okay? You're not supposed to be among the crowd. The leper probably had himself in a separate place, but he was there. Find a way out of, uh, uh, to overcome the obstacles. How do you find it? You ask the Lord who is willing to give wisdom to you at any moment and will not, you know, chastise you for being so dumb you couldn't have figured that out. Okay, human beings get tired of you asking them questions. I'm one to get tired of people asking me questions sometimes when it seems so obvious. And so even in my answer, sometimes, in a, you know, ungodly in my spirit, I feel annoyed. You know, it's like, gosh, can't you just see that? But Jesus, God does not feel annoyed. Doesn't feel, there is no question too dumb. Anything you lack knowledge about, how do I get around the fact that the doors are locked? The true story, as I understand it, of Fantasia, the one young lady who uh, was illiterate and uh, uh, won um, America's uh, Next Idol, was when she came, the doors were locked. I can't even remember how she get in, but obviously she got around that, and she pressed her way. She competed against folks with formal music education and all kinds of this and that. She was just a poor woman. African-American at that, who kept the secret, but at the, is, has since con, let it be known she was illiterate and couldn't read, but God made a way. And so whatever the obstacle that's holding you, I don't care if it's an addiction. I don't care if it's, if it's parents blocking you. I don't care if it's, you know, racism on your job or sexism on your job or you just don't have the education. God has an answer. He has wisdom and he has power and he's able. And so all we have to do is come and ask of the Lord who will give us a way, stir up in us a way to get around the obstacles that are real. Some of them, all of them, you need to pray about. Some 
you know, the Lord will teach us and guide us, order our steps. Okay, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Okay, the uh, proverb says, and so let the Lord order our steps to overcome those things that stand between his promises and his destiny for you and I and where we are right now. And then some things uh, uh, require us, all things, not just faith, but to exercise our delegated authority. He said to you, whatsoever things you bind in heaven shall be bound in earth. I mean, bound in the earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever things you loose on this earth shall be loosed in heaven. Bind the hands of Satan, operating through people and things and circumstances. Exercise your spiritual warfare and your spiritual power to call those things that be not as though they were and stand your ground because the devil is not lazy when we are. Okay, when we're insecure and fearful, that's his arsenal. He's really going to come against us. And so we must walk by faith and not by sight. So we have to overcome obstacles using our spiritual authority, using spiritual warfare, using the wisdom that God has available for us just for the asking. And then we also, you know, I've thought about, you know, as I I've matriculated now, I celebrated birthday just last week and got another year older, praise God, by the grace of God, because when I look back over the years, I know it has been God and God alone who has kept me through danger seen and unseen. I look back and honestly take assessment of the ignorance and the darkness that I walked in. But God is so loving and so kind and so merciful that he kept me and not only kept me, but in my ignorance as I sought him and tried to pursue that for which, you know, he has given me promise and vision from a child. He caused me and allowed me to matriculate. But in my honesty, as I look back, I realize I could have done so much more. Not just for my good, but for the good of others. But what hindered me is the same thing that hinders so many, particularly when you're coming out of poverty. You're coming out of places where you don't have role models in front of you, in your family and what have you, to press past the norm. Maybe nobody else moved out of the projects. Maybe nobody else went to college. Maybe nobody else became, you know, went to graduate school and became a professional. Nobody became a, was a committed uh, person of faith in the body of Christ. No other ministers, no other, you know, welders, no other, you know, people own their own business. And so those role models weren't there, but God is faithful. He has a way of being uh, all that we need. And one of the things that can be, uh, hold us back is that, as Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Here's why. One of the main one, our feelings. Okay. I, I, what if the man, you know, uh, uh, when Jesus told him to get up and take up his bed and walk by the pool, what if he stayed there because he didn't feel like it? And yet we do. Many of us, we don't feel like it. And we do what we feel like doing. We do what we feel like emotionally. We do what we feel like physically. And yet we're waiting and wondering why we don't have the blessings of God and getting depressed about that. And newsflash, the more you do, the more you are. I like to say here recently, I've been saying to a lot of folks that I mentor, the, a body in motion stays in motion, but a body at rest stays at rest. And some more we stay in our condition and not, you know, rise up to the word of God that has been given to us to, to declare and to be an overcomer and to walk on faith, but rather stay in our feelings and doing what we habitually used to, the more we are conditioned to be where we are and do what we used to. We don't get the physical, when we talk about physically getting up, the longer you lay on your mat of affliction, the weaker your muscles get and the harder it is to get up. But with God, all things are possible. No longer, how, no long, no matter how long you've been laying there, he is able, you know, as Isaiah said, to, to give us strength <laughs> to run without getting weary, to rise up and soar like eagles with wings above the problems and the issue. So we must walk by faith. If he says, get up, then do what you have to do to get up. 
need somebody to help you initially. Maybe you've been and your legs are weak. You can't immediately get up and walk 20 blocks. I'm using both a literal example and one by analogy. Okay, if you can't immediately get up from where you are and walk the equivalent of a block, you get up and just practice getting up first. And then with some help, take a few steps and then keep take. So you're building those muscles. Likewise, you know, if we're talking, let's use career. You know, I, I, I remember one of the most successful uh, nieces that I have. I remember when she was coming out of high school and her mom had her to talk to me about going to college. And I remember her telling me, I don't want to go to college. That's for smart people. That's not for me. I can't do that. And she was looking at all these vocational schools and the computer learning and so forth and so on, which are good and fine for themselves. But what was missing for me in her conversation was one that I didn't hear a passion. She was citing these things as alternatives to college because she was afraid of college. And I told her to go ahead, go back to those people who were telling her, telling me, uh, telling her that they'd been to these schools as an alternative and ask how many of them are employed. How much money are they making? What are they really doing? Did that uh, track benefit them? While I simultaneously showed her and took her on a tour of Georgetown University where I went to school and other uh, college related things. And, you know, we may have went to a play on the campus and just to try to work on this fear of this environment, which in fact was not just based on, I believe the fact that it was for smart people, but it also was based on the fact of fear that she didn't belong. It wasn't for her kind of people. And so based on this fear, this feeling, she is wanted to stay there. But she pressed forward as she moved forward, taking a step here and a step there, not immediately going to college, but eventually went to community college and from there transferred to a college. And I've got a law degree, an MBA, as well as a, a, a divinity degree, all uh, professional masters and, and, and law degree, all from top schools. And when she started her first job, not her first job, but, but soon after um, she ended her first job, which was a, a, a working for an organization where the people there were politically appointed. And she had gotten there because she had worked as a student for someone in another nonprofit who, who liked her a lot. And then subsequently he got politically appointed as the head of a big government agency and he sent and bought her there. And then by the time, eight years later or whatever, that he left and she then went for another job. She started that other job in a higher salary than I was making with all of my degrees. God is able. It may not be immediate, but open your mind and your heart. Don't rely on your feelings. Treat your feelings as an obstacle. And pray and ask God how to get around them. And decree and declare that I will walk by faith and not by sight, not by my feelings. Because if God has promises for you, and you are now in a condition where you're not feeling that you can, there's a route to get past there to the promises. You have to seek it. Again, turning back to the Lord for his wisdom, uh, uh, exercising the spiritual authority even over yourself that God has delegated. Declare, I will carry this cross. I might not be able to run, but I'm on my way. And God will strengthen me, as Isaiah said, you know, he, in, in Isaiah 40, he gives power to the faint. <laughs> we have nothing to fear because he is with us. We also have fear of failure. Suppose I try, you know, and I can't make it. Well, you know, embedded in a fear like that is a focus on our weaknesses, our inabilities. But if we would focus on faith and focus on the ability and the power of God who will lead and guide us into all truth, then we don't have to be afraid. Because if I think God is calling me, let's say, to be an attorney and God is actually calling me to be an accountant or a restaurant owner, God has a way in a sweetness to guide me and shift me as I'm going and pursuing 
to get me on the best track. Sometimes God sends us to one place so that we can build to get to another. We cannot get unstuck. We cannot get healed and delivered without faith and putting the, the reliance on our success upon God. But we must cooperate with the power of God, the call of God, the promises of God. And we must actively obey what the Lord tells us. If he says, get up, get up. We have to be bringing all of ourselves before the Lord as we come and be church people, as we come and worship and call ourselves children of God, saying that he is our Lord. So that when I come to worship, when I come to say, okay, Lord, what's the next instruction? I'm open to hear God speak to any and every area of my life. I may be interested in how do I get to the next step of being a partner in the law firm. And the Lord may be speaking to me about my role as a mother, my disciplinary practices, and then driving me deeper to realize where that came from. You know, maybe in my own family, the Lord may be dealing with me about my attitude toward sex or my attitude toward women. Bring all of yourself that we might get whole and healed and not be stuck in any area of our lives so that we can, in fact, pursue, make progress, and take hold of the things that God has promised us. Another recent thing I've been saying to younger people, Cinderella is a lie. You're not going to sit and wait and Prince Charming is coming. Your, your success requires you to actively pursue your happiness. Likewise, to achieve the things that God has a, a, a promised for us, we must cooperate with God. I'm not talking about works, being saved by works. You can't buy your salvation, but you can hinder to greater and lesser degrees, your progress and your ability to have that abundant life that he came to give. He said, I came that you might have life, you got the eternal life, and that you might have it more abundantly, walking in it. Does that mean there's never trouble? Nope. But trouble is not the definition of your life. It's just the hiccup along the way, even though it may you know, last a while. But long as you got God, who will show you a way above, around, under, and out of every trouble to continue on your journey, as he did with the children of Israel, even when they were fighting against their own progress. He is so faithful and so loving. And so our fear of failure is not, it's just, it's a feeling. And we have to decide that we are going to walk by faith despite our fear of failing because our success is not reliant upon our strength alone, our knowledge alone, our wisdom alone. It's reliant and dependent upon the wisdom and the strength and the faithfulness and the power of God. Our feelings also can also go to unworthiness, which in fact, I think is tied up with why we hide those certain places and things in our lives, even from God. If folks find out that I don't have food at home while I'm dressing, you know, like I'm a millionaire, then people would, those people we think are the most important or we want to be liked to, everybody wants to be loved, then they would look down on us or they would reject us. If people know that we didn't finish or we failed algebra or whatever, we, we often say, fake it until you make it. Certainly there's no need for everybody that we deal with to be in our, excuse me, in our personal deepest business, knowing all of our frailties, because you only let in those people who are most close to you in your inner circle. But that needs to include God, that you're putting that weakness, that need and what have you before the Lord. He's not going to reject you if he finds out that you're addicted to crack. He's not going to reject you if he finds out that you're addicted to sex or you're afraid to not have a man 
to live without having a man, to live without having a woman. He's not going to reject you to find out that you're not good with your budget. He wants you to bring all of that to him because that's what he's there for. You have not because you ask not. We have not because we ask not. And we ought to be growing in our intimacy with the Lord who knows everything you're not telling. We don't tell him anyway. But intimacy and relationship is that we are dialoguing about it. I'm not hiding it because it's really myself that I'm trying to hide it from. I can deny the fact, you know, that I... Uh, um, I'm a female all day long. It won't change the fact. I'm the only person who's not recognizing that I'm a female. I can deny the fact, you know, that I'm not, let's say I don't cook cakes well, which is not true, but, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't change the fact. Everybody knows my cakes are not good. And by denying it and not facing it myself, I miss the opportunity to learn how to do it better and improve my cake making or whatever it is. I'm not good with dealing with authority figures. That's true of me. Why? Because you look back through history uh, 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 as it, in my own personal life and in my cultural life, and there are plenty of reasons why I wouldn't. But faith says bringing that to the Lord because he also says respect people in authority. And so if I'm going to live the fullness of the word of God in my life, I have to bring that to the Lord. Lord, my feelings, my anger, my experiences make this a problem area in my life. Help me. I cannot do it. And he gives wisdom. He gives strength. And he doesn't chastise or laugh, laugh at or belittle. Because that's what he's there for. We also have fear, and maybe this is one of the biggest that never gets talked about, fear of success, fear of the unknown, because we know what it looks like and feels like to be where we are right now. We've gotten comfortable with it. We've got friends who uh, uh, support us and accept us right where we are, but actually pushing forward to be this other thing, to achieve these other levels. We don't, we fear failure, but we also fear success because we don't know what it means to act and behave and be a part of that social economic class. We're afraid that it will change us and make us bad somehow. We're afraid that we won't fit in and which is really then a, a failure thing or whatever. We have fear about the unknown. There's nothing unnatural about that. But newsflash, it's fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. If God has called you to move to China, you can bet that the Lord is going to give you everything you need, language-wise, culture-wise, every otherwise, to live in China, to accomplish the things that the Lord would have you to accomplish in China. If God has called you out of the projects to be a doctor, God is going to transition you and teach you what the norms are. There are norms in college that are not the same as in uh, high school. When you go to high school, the teacher is hands-on, at least particularly when I was there, and still to some degree. There, you know, are you getting your homework and marking to see if your homework was done and giving you a grade so you're getting a feedback all through the semester to know how well you're getting the material and then, you, you know, to know how to study and what to improve on. In college, there's less of that. You have homework assignments that may be discussed to some degree, with or without you in class, lectures will go on. Nobody's keeping attendance to see if you're there. Nobody's giving you grades on the uh, uh, homework every day, back and forth, to see how well you're keeping up. And then there's either just the final or there's a midterm. And if you haven't made it your business to be responsible to make sure that you have been learning the material all along, when it comes down for the midterm, you'll find out 
to your detriment or to your pleasure or success. And that midterm may be worth half your grade. It may not be worth much at all. It may be a gauge, but I'm saying it's a different culture. It's a different way of learning. And the Lord, when he calls us from one place to another, if we lean on him and, and, and call upon him and trust in him, will guide and lead us to help us understand the norms for each step of the way. I look back and realize I never, I was stuck in terms of, of, of we'll just call them norms, a way of interaction and expectation and what it takes to be successful. I didn't have that teaching and guiding and I didn't know that I didn't know. I didn't know how to ask for it. I could, you know, particularly when you're a female and minority and so forth, it's easier to get into a place of just feeling left out and feeling angry or whatever. It doesn't occur to you to seek a mentor, that there could be a mentor out there. And if it doesn't occur to you to seek a mentor, it doesn't occur to you that God is an available mentor if you can't find a human and bring those things to the Lord and he will guide and lead and open doors that no man can shut and close doors that no man can follow. We're afraid of that unknown because we've heard it and we've seen it, that when you move from one level to another level, a lot of the things behind in terms of behaviors and habits and practices and companions and friends and so forth, you leave behind if you're going to be successful in this next role. And so there are doors that have to be closed. And many of us fear that. We're so, we, we're so comfortable with where we are. We're willing to sacrifice our success. And too many in our community, those sacrifices and not moving on to the next level and what have you, means that we have a, a way too many, too much of a percentage in our community who are not able to take care of themselves economically. We're dependent on charity. We're dependent on government subsidy. Because we've made comfort where we are. And we resound, uh, surround ourselves with what really is codependent enablers, even in our churches, who even can preach in ways that discourage folk from progressing. We'll wrap Jesus around our non-progression. The Lord has got us here now, and the Lord is, I, I, I feel real good about how much I serve the church. I feel real good about how much I preach. And I'm content to just be feeling good about my service in the church and my preaching and, and what I do for Miss Johnson next door and just resolve myself that I'm going to be entry level on my job and just matriculate there you know, for 20 years until I can get a retirement, which won't enable me to live any more comfortably or any more self-sufficiently than I am right now. Or worse than that, many who are not even in the workforce and just receiving subsidy checks of some kind or another or child support and living off of that or trying to, but because of that, they have to have subsidized housing or this or that. And we've grown comfortable with that. We stopped striving too many. That was a politically unpopular thing to say. My heart is for the needy. My heart is for the widow and the orphan. My heart is for those who, you know, you don't know what you don't know. But we've got to do something, particularly in the body of Christ, to identify, confess, and seek ways to overcome being stuck where we are. We are the light of the world. And people ought to take note of us like they did with Peter, that we have been with Jesus, despite our education levels. That we have been our, our lives evidence, not just in our preaching and teaching, which is number one, no doubt but also in our living, the way we love and care for our spouses and our children and train them up in the way that they should go. Not just let them do whatever they want to do, which seems to be the cultural norm today. I don't understand it, but I guess that 
It's evidence that I got a year older last month. Not just do whatever I want, but we are ambassadors. We are evidence of the power of God in the lives of people who believe in, and put their faith in Jesus. And that should be evidence not just in our testimonies of salvation, but in our testimonies that says, look where he brought me from. Not just out of darkness into the marvelous light. He did that. But he took me from a place uh, uh, of this level of living to a whole nother place of living. I'm not talking about prosperity for the sake of prosperity. I'm talking about being uh, uh, self-sufficient and not only having enough for myself, but enough to share and be a part of the ministry of God through collective action, meaning churches and ministries and so forth, but also in my own personal activity. The word said, if you give, it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It ought to be evidence in our lives. And it's, you know, he will give seed to the sower. For what? So that the, what we have gotten can be sown and made into more. So that we have not just for ourselves, but overflow for the benefit of others. And God is faithful. And so if we're not seeing it, in the ways that we, we have to look at, where are we stuck? What are the obstacles here that are preventing us from actually living in the abundant life that God has provided? And while I'm on the topic, my concern as I see politically, socially, professionally, as, as a minister, is folks are not only, uh, I wish you could hear some of the calls that come into my agency, they're not only comfortable, or made themselves comfortable in the places of inadequacy, but folks are actually setting them as their goals. Their goal is, you know, uh, what are they trying, I'm trying to get me a subsidized house. Not as a short time uh, 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 assistance so that I can move toward this bigger goal, but that's just what I want. And that's it. I'm trying to get a, you know, this kind of a benefit and that's it. And it's, it's a real manifestation where, you know, the, of the darkness that seems to be covering our nation, our world, our communities. It's, it's like folks are blinded. I have said to folks, don't you understand that dependence on these subsidies is a trap? One, it helps to basically, the devil can basically count you out of ever being able to, to, to be independent, to live for the Lord without hindrance, to be self-sufficient. You'll always be dependent, and therefore you will always not be free. Freedom is independent. And so be careful about what gifts you accept, what subsidies you accept. What are you paying in order to receive that? There are things sometimes in our lives, in our conditions, by way of disability, physical, age, and so forth, we have to do what we have to do. But be sure it's worth the price. And will it in of itself permanently disable you from ever being able to be free? He came to set us free. We're in Black History Month. Our forefathers and foremothers fought and died that we might be free, not just free from slavery, because we were already free from slavery in the 1950s and 60s, but free to be equal citizens, to have equal access and equal enjoyment and equal respect. And just like Jesus died and made salvation available for us, they laid their lives down, they sacrificed, they set their goals on, on doing these things so that we all, they and us, but particularly us, 
would have freedom, the opportunity to be equal. They did it. Just like Jesus, however, what they did, the benefit of what they did is not automatic. You are not saved by the blood of Jesus until you accept it and act upon it. Until you turn from your way and cast your uh, uh, life upon him. Invite him into your heart and into your mind to save your soul and guide you and lead you into godliness. It's available to everybody, but everybody doesn't have it. I mean, have it because everybody doesn't accept. Likewise, the right to vote, equal rights and, and housing and other things are there. And while there's still some obstacles being trying to be placed in, in, in front of people, they are most successful when people don't do what it takes to take hold of those freedoms. I have the right to be economically free and equal, but if I don't do the things that it takes to be economically, <coughs> excuse me, economically free and equal, then I remain equal, even though the laws have changed, even though the culture has changed. For many, not all, but for many. I have a right to be equal, to vote equally. But I don't do it, therefore it's not mine. How many in our communities across race, creed, and color do not exercise the right? And how many of concern is particularly in the African-American culture, have thrown away that right to participate in a small way, but small things put together make a large thing, have thrown away that right for themselves and to some degree for the collective because they chose something immediate, some drugs, some perverted crime, some shoplifting. I remember when I was practicing law, my heart was broken when I would have these cases appointed to me from st uh, uh, of students at Howard University and other prominent universities in Washington, D.C., who had been arrested on felony theft charges because they'd come over to Northern Virginia to the big shopping centers and steal sweaters and bedroom sets and so forth and so on that would be worth more than the minimum amount to make a crime a felony in Virginia. And once you're convicted of a felony, guess what? You're no longer eligible to vote. Your parents have sent you from the Midwest, from California, from, I don't care, from Washington, I mean, from Washington itself, to go to school looking for you to move on up and make a life for yourself. And in foolishness, you have thrown away one of your most fundamental rights for a sweater for a comforter set. So we're free, we have the opportunity to be economically equal, but we must take it. We must respect it, we must guard it, we must act on it and do the things it takes to overcome the obstacles that stand in our way from taking hold of those things that God has promised to us and made available to us. We must be intentional. We must resist the pull of being, uh, 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 doing the things with our friends. God is graceful and merciful. I remember when I first graduated law school in U at UCLA and I came back home. All I had was the friends I used to have. None of them had gone to college, let alone to graduate school, but I was hanging out. And I remember, I'll never forget, one evening, it must have been about one o'clock, one of our one o'clock, in the morning, one of our friends had had a party uh, over in Prince George's County somewhere, and we went, it's called uh, White on the Lawn. So everybody was wearing white. It was a beautiful, beautiful summer evening, perfect weather. We were partying, and the song, Nothing But the Dog in Me, was, I remember that because we were out there just dancing to that song in the backyard, and it was great party and so forth and so on. Wonderful party. 
you know, I never, my thing is, it, was that my choice? No, I just hadn't made friends. I hadn't given that part of my spirit and my need to the Lord and listened so he could guide me into more appropriate friends. Because, you know, I knew the girl's boyfriend sold drugs. I didn't do drugs. I wasn't even drinking like that. But it was a party. You know, I'm lonely. You know, like every, all of my friends, my siblings, you know, were there. We went and what have you. It wasn't a couple of months, it wasn't even a month later, I don't think, when I heard on the news that somebody had come to that house looking for her boyfriend, some kind of a drug territorial beef, and killed everybody in the house. His 21-year-old brother, their seven-year-old daughter, my friend, his girlfriend, he wasn't there. And I immediately, I know it was the Holy Ghost, thought, it could have been me in that place. It wasn't for me. And that's when the Lord pressed upon me, this is not your circle. I had to put that before the Lord. Believe the Lord to guide and lead me. Which I did. Easy? No. Because as I explained to somebody the other day, as I was trying to matriculate and better myself, People in the old neighborhood, you know, they call your names. You think you're too good. You think you're white, this and that and whatever. In the church even, well, you you know, you think you're more holy or whatever. But you have to stick closer to that man, that one who sticks closer than a brother. And that's the Lord as he guides you to overcome the obstacles that seem to prevent you from getting up from laying at that place, waiting for others to come and get you from being back in society to freely worship the Lord, to be healed of those things that doctors and lawyers haven't been able to do over the years, to be delivered from those dark secret places and weaknesses and fears. God is able. The way to overcome being stuck is turn to God and do what the Lord says do. Open your mind and heart to hear from the Lord in every aspect of your life. Hide nothing from the Lord. And do what you have to do. Amen, my brothers and sisters. I pray and believe God has given somebody something out of that word today. And I invite you to join us again next week, same time, 11 o'clock, for the Gospel Truth broadcast of Servants for Christ Baptist Church, which is located 713 Katy Drive in Fort Washington. We worship at 8 a.m. every Sunday morning, and we invite you to come and join us where the pastor is uh, Reverend Dr. Jerry W. Jones, Sr., uh, and First Lady Patricia Jones. We would love to have you, and in the meantime, stick to God, stick to the gospel truth, and we will see you next week. Amen.